Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Well, we've been spending some time in the Epistle of James, and it's no surprise to me that James closes this writing with an admonition on prayer to God for wisdom and knowledge for every area of life. You see, by praying, we experience the understanding that God's grace is sufficient for all of our needs and that he is sovereign over all of them. James chapter 5, we're going to turn to, beginning at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed." The effect of prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. To think that as God's children, we can come freely and boldly to his throne and share with him our needs is amazing. Seven times in this section, James mentioned prayer. We should be prayerful in the troubles of life. Instead of complaining about our situation, talk to God about it and know that God hears and answers our prayers. We also learn from James that the tongue, well, our tongue can be used for a variety of reasons, not all of them holy and honorable. Well, praying to God, that's the correct use of the tongue. The promise of the Bible is that prayer provides power in our life. So why do so few of us experience that power? You might agree with the author who wrote, I find it easier to preach on prayer than to pray. I find it easier to write on prayer than to pray. I find it easier to talk about Jesus than to pray. I find anything I do in my Christian life easier than praying. Perhaps Martin Luther had the right insight when he wrote, I have so many things to do today, I dare not ignore my time with God. Charles Spurgeon discovered that Luther spent an average of three hours in prayer each day. And he accomplished more for the faith than most. It said that the Reformation actually began in Luther's prayer closet. I believe all Reformation, individual or corporate, begins on our knees before God. James, the servant of God who wrote this letter, he was known as James the Righteous. James, the man of prayer. 
I want to share some life circumstances that James encourages us to submit to prayer. First, James urges us to pray when we are in trouble and sickness. We see that in verses 13 and 14. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. If any of you are sick, they should call for the elders of the church, and the elders should pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. A few years ago, a fascinating experiment was conducted on the power of prayer. Dr. Randolph Byrd, a cardiologist with the San Francisco General Medical Center's Coronary Care Unit, did a scientific study on prayer involving heart patients. Nearly 400 patients participated in a 10-month double-blind experiment that was scientifically controlled and documented. The patients were divided into two groups with no statistical difference between group A or B. The patients were not told which group they were in. Group B received no prayer support. Each patient in group A had two people praying for them. Those who prayed for the patients were scattered throughout the country and did not know the patient's name, only the person's medical problem. But when the results were tabulated, the findings revealed that patients in group A did as well or better in virtually every comparison. Well, the conclusion drawn by those who analyzed the study was, intercessory prayer appears to have beneficial effects in patients in a coronary care unit. Well, James knew this, he knew this reality 2,000 years ago. That's why as Christians, we go to hospitals and bedsides and, and, and we pray for healing. Second, you know, there's a connection between sickness and sin. We see this there in verse uh, 15. It says, prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health, and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. This biblical reality is also expressed in the 32nd Psalm, beginning at verse 1. It says, The one whose wrongdoing is forgiven, whose sin is covered over, is truly happy. The one the Lord doesn't consider guilty, in whose spirit there is no dishonesty, that one is truly happy. When I kept quiet, my bones wore out. I was groaning all day long, every day, every night, because your hand was heavy upon me. My energy was sapped as if in a summer drought. So I admitted my sin to you. I didn't conceal my guilt. I'll confess my sins to the Lord is what I said. Then you removed the guilt of my sin. That's why all the faithful should pray to you during troubled times so that a great flood of water won't reach them. Then notice the joy that flows, that floods his soul when he confesses his sins. Verses 5 and 6, notice the renewal and the refreshment that is testified to then in verse 7. It says, you are my secret hideout. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of rescue. Simply put, there is a connection and a correlation between our sinful actions and our physical and mental health. Perhaps there has been a painful moral compromise or, or some ethical conflict in your financial life that has gone unconfessed or unforgiven. You carry that around in your head and your heart. And this burden, I tell you, all of the alcohol or entertainment or dope in the world will not erase that. 
The remedy, it's simple. First of all, we confess our sins. That's what the psalmist did. James instructs from our reading of Psalm 32. And today in, in James chapter 5, says there's no indication of what that sin was. The psalmist speaks about disobedience to the Lord. But disobedience can take many forms. He could have taken up some harmful habit, been unfaithful to his wife when he was out of town. All we know is that when he refused to speak about it, he slowly wasted away. When he declared his sin, well, he was on his way back. There is no situation beyond the reach of the tender touch of God. Now, I want to suggest that sickness sometimes stems from the fact that we either cannot or will not acknowledge and confess what lies within us. You know, James writes, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There is that tender touch that each soul needs. Confession has, and confession will always be, good for the soul. Third, the concept of healing the soul and the emotions is as old as humankind. Dr. Alvarez of the famed Mayo Clinic in Minnesota stated that 70% of the stomach problems he encounters as a specialist are not organic, but originate in persons allowing circumstances to choke off the benefits that faith in God provides for our well-being. He said that faith is as important as eating the right food in controlling stomach problems. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. Now, I believe in divine healing. I don't believe in these self-appointed divine healers. I believe Jesus is the master healer. Jesus is the great physician. The anointing with oil that was mentioned in verse 14 has always been a symbol of the healing touch of God. Remember how in the 23rd Psalm it says, you anoint my head with oil. The cure, however, is not in the oil, but in the power behind the oil. I mean, Jesus used clay and mud and spittle as other visual aids in the tender touch of healing that he shared with others. His touch encompasses and makes all other touches work to our good and wholeness. To show you how, how old this understanding of the connection between our physical and our spiritual need is, hear this prayer, which can be found in a marble wall plaque at the great Chester Cathedral in England. Give me a good digestion, Lord. Give me something to digest. Give me a healthy body, Lord, with sense to keep it at its best. Give me a healthy mind, good Lord, to keep the good and pure in sight, which seeing sin is not appalled, but finds a way to set it right. Give me a mind that is not bored, that does not whimper, whine, nor sigh. Don't let me worry over much about the fussy things called I. Give me a sense of humor, Lord. Give me the grace to see a joke, to get some pleasure out of life, and to pass it on to other folk. Our health, in large part, depends on our faith. 103rd Psalm, verse 3, look at what it says. How God forgives all your sins heals all your sickness. Fourth, we see the power of an intercessory prayer in verse 16. It says, for this reason, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
the prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. There is a mystery to the power of intercessory prayer. There are times when God says no to the form of our prayer, but he says yes to the substance of our prayers. Let me try to explain it this way as I share with you the story of St. Augustine. St. Monica's Falls in California is named after Augustine's mother, Monica, who, who cried great tears over her son. She flooded her soul with anguish because her son was not a Christian. Monica prayed that her son would not leave North Africa and go to Italy because she wanted so desperately for him to become a Christian. Well, Augustine, being ambitious and wanting very much to go to Italy, decided that he would defy the request of his mother and he'd go to Italy anyway. The day before Augustine was to leave for Italy, his mother prayed all day in a small chapel by the sea that her son would somehow reconsider and decide not to go to Italy. Well, as is typical with most sons, he did what he wanted to do anyway and boarded the ship for Italy. On his way there, he fell into a conversation with a notable Christian. And while on that ship, he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. He accepted Christianity as his way of life and became one of the greatest writers and thinkers of the Christian faith. You see, God did not answer the form of Monica's prayer, but God did answer its substance. Yes, God does not answer our prayers, not always in the way that we envision it or design it. Remember, Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, making intercessions for us as our great high priest. There is power in our prayers because there is perfect power in our God. You know, Max Lucado is right when he states, the power of prayer is not in the one who prays, but in the one who hears it. And finally, we are to pray for those who have strayed from the sheepfold. We must remember those that, that have strayed or, or are inactive. But they're not the enemy. Those that have strayed, they are victims of the enemy. They need our love. You cannot pray for a person without loving them as Christ loves us. Our prayers can make a difference. And there's a great joy in turning a person around and, and now pointing them in the right direction. There's a story of a pastor that was driving to some destination when he came across three men trying to push their disabled car off the road. It was raining and it was muddy. And the pastor tried to decide whether to stop and, and get disheveled or to press on. Well, finally, his more generous impulses won out, and he did stop. The older man got in the car, and his two sons, plus the pastor, pushed the car and eventually got it off to the side of the road. When the father got out of the car, he took the pastor's hands and said, I'm very glad you came along. You had just enough strength added to ours to make the things go. Well, the pastor reflected upon those words as he drove down the road. He thought there are so many people trying to get their load over the hill. I have just enough strength that when added to their own, we can make things go. You see, that's what our tender touch does. It joins the spirit and soul of another pilgrim and surrounds that person with strength that, that they can feel 
and it just allows them to go on. G.K. Chesterton was right when he noted, more things are wrought by prayer than this world will ever know. And so we bring our study of James to a close. Perhaps you've noticed there is no farewell, there's no benediction to end this epistle. Unlike Paul's letters, there is no closure to this one. At first, I thought, well, that was rather abrupt and that a close was ending, was missing from this letter. However, I had to remind myself that James was more of a preacher than a polished writer. There is something missing, though. What is missing, you ask? Our response. James deliberately ends his letter this way. James is saying, this letter is not complete until we put it into action. It's not complete until we use our tongues as instruments of the kingdom of God rather than as an assassin's bullet. It's not complete until we lift others by prayer into the holy, tender, loving hands of God. It is not complete until there is this great consistency between our talk and our walk. My prayer, God give me the courage and the strength to do so. Let's pray. Gracious God, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your countless mercy, your grace, and all the love and the blessings you just pour out upon each and every one of us. Father, I lift up those right now that are committing to this deeper time with you in prayer. I think of those that may be suffering right now, Father. We pray for them that, that you will draw near and you will comfort, you will heal, you will provide guidance and direction. Just draw near to every single viewer right now, Father. I humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of another Lessons for Living television program. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, would you do me a favor? Would you let your friends and family know that you tune in and encourage them to tune in also? You know, one of the ways you can have them exposed to our program, if they've never watched it before, is by visiting our Lessons for Living television website at l4ltv.com. There you're going to see a tab that is previous programs. All of the previous programs are accessible from that page. You can go right back to our first season. They can watch the programs. They can share those programs with friends. You know, they can re-watch them if there's something that, you know, they'd like to further study. So please help us get the word out to the community that Lessons for Living Television is on the air every week. Now, while you're on the website, a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. One is the to the Bible study groups. If you're interested in joining a Bible study group, contact me through the website and we'll arrange that for you. I have a section there called Archived Sermons, different messages I've given around the country and you can watch those, you can download them. There's a handout with a lesson study you can download also. There is a uh, live appearances tab which will show where I'm appearing live and I don't know, if I'm out where you are, why not come out and see me? And we, You can introduce yourself. There's a Donate Today tab, which is really important also, where folks uh, just feel impressed by the Holy Spirit to contribute a donation financially to the, to the furtherance of this ministry. Every single dollar that is donated goes directly to the television ministry. It goes to paying for the air time, it pays for the studio time, it pays for the gifts. Not one penny of the donations comes to me or my family in any sort of bonus or salary. I pastor a church and I'm paid a salary through that work. This ministry is a ministry of love. 
that uh, we do through the generosity of friends and family and many of our viewers. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, we would appreciate it. But if you feel the Holy Spirit has impressed you to do that, you will get a charitable donation receipt for income tax purposes should you make a donation. We're quickly running out of time. I want to remind you of our missionnowcanada.com website, which is our overseas humanitarian work. Check that out. Maybe you can join us on an upcoming mission trip. We'd love to have you. It can be, I know it sounds cliche, but it can be a life-changing experience. Follow me on Instagram, Santos underscore Bill. Every morning, a one-minute devotional video every morning goes out there. You can start your day with that devotional video. Like our Facebook page, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and within an hour from the end of this program, you can go on our SoundCloud account and you can download an audio version of this program. You can carry it with you and you can listen to the program at your convenience. We are all out of time. Thank you, thank you for being here. Let's do this again next time. God bless you. We'll see you then.